Super, thank you so much. So I'm Annabelle O'Neill. I'm based here in Melbourne that is um, on land that belongs to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I work for an organisation that plants native biodiverse forests to um, help fight the impacts of climate change. But I'm here today um, as a parent to two kids who are aged nine and 12. We're by no means a perfect model family in terms of our um, quest to quest for the climate. We're absolutely on a journey to increase our knowledge um, so that together we can make good choices and um, be empowered to take practical climate action for our future. I'm Marty, I'm on Garrigal Country in the very north of Sydney. Um, like to acknowledge all the um, traditional custodians of our land and recognise the amazing work that they continue to do taking care of this wonderful country. And today I hope we do them uh, respect by talking about what we will do going forward to reverse the impacts of climate change. Um, I uh, took this uh, step because I've been um, trying to make a difference in the environment space for a long time and uh, it was interesting I always thought that climate leaders had to be sort of um, actors or that you know were um, CEOs of these really sort of big personalities and then as I started to meet people who'd actually done it I realized that everybody has a role to play in this so it was very exciting to be able to join and uh, I'm the father of two uh, six-year-old Coco and eight-year-old Annika and um, they're very into the environment and uh, very much interested in um, what we're going to do. And hi, I'm Charlotte. I am um, I'm speaking to you from Warramai Land, which is also known as Bluey's Beach or Pacific Palms. Um, I grew up in Awabakal land and I currently live in Gadigal land, also known as Bondi. So I'd like, also like to acknowledge the, the elders, past, present and emerging uh, future leaders, the original custodians of, uh, of sustainability really and keeping our land good for so long until we came along. So I, I'm a mum of a one and a four year old, which is generation alpha. I'll get into that a bit later in, in when I do my bit of a talk. And I'm the same. I'm really just trying to navigate this world. Um, I've been working in sustainability for a long time and I'm so glad to see that there's momentum behind it and there's, um, there's desire to change. Uh, and I'm really excited about what the next generation will do. But, you know, obviously we have to do a lot more right now. We can't wait for them to, uh, to hold the candle. So um, I guess we'll get straight into it. Marty. <laughs> I was just looking at our uh, agreed order. We all met um, just a couple of months ago as part of uh, the climate reality training, which you might have heard of, but uh, you will know uh, the name associated. It was uh, made famous by Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. Um, Al Gore then um, went around the world training people in uh, climate reality, uh, which is essentially his presentation that was caught in that film and then has become, you know, continues to evolve as the climate continues to change, but also as the solutions continue to change. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, we're not climate scientists, uh, nor are we psychologists, and we know that we're talking about talking to children. We're just sharing our experiences and the training and knowledge that we've sort of gained through our professional careers and the climate reality training. We're parents wanting to take action in our lives, and we're just hoping that our story will inspire uh, and encourage action by others. Over to Annabelle. Thank you. So Al Gore left us with the idea that there's really only three questions to answer now. Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? So first of all, must we change? Yeah, absolutely. The scientific community has been telling us all around the world for a long, long time that we must change. Yeah. And now, um, you know, our earth and, and nature is demonstrating that this is the case. So um, for my next slide, I, I kind of wanted to talk about or, you know, through this presentation, I want to offer some facts. Obviously, you all know your kids best of all and will know what information is at the right level for them. Um, 
and what is appropriate, what is not too dramatic or too scary based on their age and experience. I think um, one thing that I am really mindful of with, with my guys is that I can't always control all of the information that reaches them. So um, I have tried hard to give them some basic facts so that um, you know they can kind of proactively prepare for the information that's coming. And I think the first step in understanding climate change is really about understanding our atmosphere. Um, and I think it's a little bit ab abstract for, you know, even as an adult, but I think particularly as a kid to go outside, stand and look up at the sky and imagine that it's not just endless sky that goes on forever, that there is in fact an atmosphere there, which is like a thin layer. Um, the way that I've talked to my kids about this is it being like a, it's, it's a bit like a bubble that wraps up our planet and, and keeps us safe. So it's a, a thin bubble and it lets, um, you know, warmth and light from the sun come in, but it keeps, it protects us from the harshest rays of the sun and it also protects us from the freezing coldness of space. Now it lets some warmth come in and it traps some of the warmth inside, which is a really good thing because it keeps our planet at, um, at the perfect temperature for us, or it has for a very long time at least. And one of the things that this bubble atmosphere does is it also lets some of the, um, some of the greenhouse gases travel um, in and out of it. And the greenhouse gases are, you know, all sorts of gases. It's the oxygen we breathe as well as a bunch of other gases. So it's normal that some of them would get trapped inside and some would, um, would move through the atmosphere. So if you can flick to the next slide, please, Marty. <clears throat> Um, the basics of um, the science of global, global warming have been known for a long, long time, since about the 1800s. Um, and, it, and at its most basic, it's really about energy comes from the sun in, um, to the earth in the form of light. Um, that energy is absorbed into the earth and, um, and it creates warm, it keeps our earth warm. And then some of that energy is radiated back out um, and it warms up. Now, um, as that happens, um, some of it, as I said, is trapped in the bubble or the shell of atmosphere, um, which as I said, it's a good thing. It, it keeps our planet, or it has for a very, very long time, kept our planet at a stable temperature. However, what's happening now, as um, some of the pollution gases are going into our atmosphere, is that that, um, that atmosphere is, is thickening and it's holding in more of the, um, of the warmth than it, than it needs to. And our globe is, is really warming up at an unprecedented rate. Now, there are lots of sorts of pollution. You can flip over the next one, please, Marty. There's lots of pollution, oops, um, that are doing that. And, um, and your kids, if you had a chat with your kids, probably they would be aware of, of what is causing this pollution. It's lots and lots of things. It's agriculture, it's food waste, it's transport, it's aeroplanes. But by and large, the number one contributor to this is the burning of fossil fuels. So here you can see just how dramatically that burning has increased since the Second World War. Uh, right now, it's about it, fossil fuels still account for about 80% of all of the world's energy, and the admission, emissions from those are really a, a massive contributing factor to climate change. Um, so pollution, as um, demonstrated here by my daughter Polly, um, has has caused an, uh, has caused sorry temperatures to rise dramatically. Um, as a result of, um, of being trapped in the Earth's atmosphere. So right now we are putting about 152 million tonnes of human-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere every single day. Um, now this is obviously can be a really confronting idea for kids. Um, I did a little bit of research and found what I, I found to be a really useful podcast on NPR last year. Um, where they had spoken to a bunch of educators and a bunch of psychologists, which, um, which none of us are, none of Marty, um, Charlotte and myself are, but, um, but it was a su suggested script that could be useful for kids as young as four or five, which is that humans are burning lots and lots of fossil fuels for energy in planes, in cars, to light our houses, and that's putting greenhouse gases into the air. Those gases wrap around the planet like a blanket and make everything hotter. 
A hotter planet means bigger storms. It melts ice at the poles, so oceans will rise. It makes it harder for animals to find places to live. And it's a really, really big problem. But there's lots of smart people working hard on it. And there's lots that we can do as a family to help. <laughs> so I think that's, um, I found that very helpful. The reality for me and for my children is my children have never known a summer that hasn't had fires and extreme heats. 19 of the 20 hottest years on records have occurred in, um, since 2021. So in the, in the last 20 years. And in fact, the five hottest years ever on record are the last five years. Like 1998. Oh. So, as I said, I think you know anyone who's lived in Australia has absolutely seen um, the the real impact of climate change. We you know we remember um, the summer that we've just had. We remember the bushfires. I think what um, I found a little bit more abstract is the idea. Um, that it's, you know, more than 90% or about 90% of all of the extra heat that, that we're experience is being trapped, um, you know, or, you know, in, that is trapped in our atmosphere is going into our oceans. Now, obviously, this is having an impact on um, the ocean's plant life, on the coral and also the critters who live in the ocean. It's also having an impact on ocean-based storms like hurricanes, like cyclones, like typhoons. These storms are becoming much worse and much more aggressive, which is, which is pretty scary. Um, and I think it's a confusing concept as well, this idea that, that one thing, be it climate change or global warming, can on, one hand, on the one hand be causing droughts and fires and at the same time be causing, you know, storms and more rain and more flooding. Um, but it is the same cause and the reality is that it is just all the extra heat being trapped in here is changing those weather patterns. So in some areas it is raining a whole lot more while in other areas they're not getting um, enough rain and it's leaving places really, really dry. Um, so finally for me, I wanted to talk about our, our wildlife. At this rate, we, lis we risk losing more than half of all of our land-based land land wildlife um, before the end of this century. Um, in my family, this is the number one topic that triggers most of our conversations about climate change. This is largely due to my daughter, who is um, very, very conscious of animals. Um, it's, I, I think when I started working at, or when I was thinking about working at, at Greenfleet and um, my daughter came in and I had all these papers out and I was looking at pictures of turtles. She said, why are you looking at these turtles? And I said, well, I'm thinking about working for an organisation that, that plants forests to, to help the climate. And she said, yes, but why are you looking at turtles? So I talked to her about this idea that, you know, Greenfleet had planted 90,000 trees next to a beach. And as well as absorbing the, the carbon emissions into that forest, it was also going to build a big green wall that was going to block the light to help save those, those turtles who were getting confused by all the light pollution. And she took me by the shoulders and looked me right in the eyes and said, Mum, you have to get that job. Um, so here I am. Um, I think it's a, look, it's a really sobering fact that right now, um, climate change, along with, fact, you know, associated factors like ecosystem loss, means that we are on track for the largest extinction event that has been seen since the loss of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Thanks so much, Annabelle. Um, the next two questions are, can we change and must we change? And we, we shouldn't confuse those two. So I'm gonna talk about the solutions that are available to us, and then Charlotte's going to talk about whether or not we're gonna take those on. So uh, I'll just quickly talk to some of the issues that are causing climate change as, uh, and I will point it out, this is the many things that are happening. Um, but in Australia, our, our biggest contribution is um, energy 
through transport, uh, coal mines, but predominantly it's the burning of fossil fuels and the main one that we're burning in Australia is indeed coal. So can we do anything about that? Well, investments in renewables and energy efficiency create three times more jobs on average than in the fossil fuel technologies. And the reason for that is not just the fact that uh, you know, that the, it's exciting, but it, it's the fact that coal is an older technology and people are actually, um, you know, really seeing the benefits of uh, utilising the available natural resources from the sun, from the wind, things like that, rather than digging up old carbon and burning it. So, in the world globally, wind could supply electricity 40 times over. So what that means is that the wind itself, just by harnessing that, could supply all of our energy needs. And then of course, there's the sun. Now, uh, according to what those wonderful scientists out there um, who can explain it much better than I, there's enough solar energy reaching the earth every hour to power the all of the world's energy needs for a year. So every hour there's enough sunlight coming into the earth and that we could capture, that we have the technology to capture. If we can just increase the fraction of the solar energy around the world that we're capturing, that would massively reduce the fossil fuel burning that we're doing. Now this is the exciting thing, is that this, we've known about this for a while, but this is also part of our messaging to parents when talking to children is we've only recently learned how to um, capture solar electricity, um, but we now have the ability. So this right here, you'll see in 1954, that's when Bell Systems really started capturing electricity um, via solar panels. So prior to that, it made sense to burn coal because they didn't have this technology available to them. Now we are 70 years later and it's widely available. Australians lead the world in uh, residential solar. So over 2 million residential solar or how roofs around Australia have solar panels. And one of the really important factors here is the cost. So as you can see here, the cost of crystalline silicon in the 70s was around $80 for the cell. And now that's dropped to 25 cents per watt. So that is a huge increase. So you, you imagine when they first developed those, that was for things like satellites and really important installations. Now I can uh, charge my iPhone with my own personal solar panel. And uh, that's just uh, one example of the many, many ways that we are learning to adapt this technology. So Australians, uh, as well as being uh, world leaders in solar panels, also invented the Hills Hoist. So in Australia, we've known for a long time that there are other simple non-technological ways to uh, harness the sun's power. So instead of using a dryer, you can just hang your clothes out in the, in the sun or just on a windy day and you don't have to burn fossil fuels in order to dry your clothes. Really simple way to go about it. Now, the good news for families is that uh, in the United States, wind turbine service technician is the fastest growing job uh, in, and by 2028, solar uh, installer is also now the third fastest growing job in the United States. Just uh, for the record, we're in Australia and I tried really hard to find similar statistics <laughs> and uh, I gave up at some point, but I am reasonably confident that with all of the uh, technologies going on in Australia, this, there will be similar statistics out there. So the other important factor is, um, storing that energy. So one of the common criticisms of uh, solar is, well, you know, we also need energy at night. And that's where storage capacity comes in. 
So batteries are critical uh, to the electric vehicle market, which is something I'll talk to in a moment. Uh, but in uh, 2016, um, the global storage capacity uh, was three gigawatts, which is almost two times the storage capacity seen in 2011. The forecasts now are that we will reach 900 gigawatts of uh, global cumulative storage capacity by 2040, which is more than enough to power most people at least overnight. Now, hundreds of Australian companies have certified carbon neutral. So what that means is that they are offsetting all of their electricity. Now, here's, a, here's an example of uh, some organisations that you've probably heard of and hopefully wouldn't be too surprised that, you know, WWF and even the Sydney Opera House have gone carbon neutral. But it's not just these ones. Here are some names that might surprise you that have become certified carbon neutral organizations in the last couple of years. And what that means is these guys are offsetting every bit of carbon they're putting into the atmosphere. It's important to note that people always emit, you know, the, the technologies that we use, we're always going to have some negative impact on the environment. What these organizations here are doing is trying to, as best to recompense for that and put their um, profits back into the world. Here's another interesting development is that almost every auto manufacturer in the world now is uh, planning for electric models to hit the market. Most of these organizations already have electric cars in the market, but that is the way that everyone is moving. Um, one of the comments uh, we had in planning for this is that we can't afford them. Well, the good news is that you can now buy secondhand electric vehicles in Australia at reasonably affordable prices. There are ex-government vehicles out there, but all the Nissan Leafs are now secondhand vehicles, so it doesn't need to be a flashy Tesla. Tesla's um, done a really great job of making everyone aware of it, but now we as Australians can enjoy this. And the important thing to note is uh, Australia stopped producing um, vehicles. We don't, we don't manufacture our own cars anymore. So we don't have a say anymore. If the rest of the world decide to manufacture only electric vehicles, then in the next 10 to 20 years, that's all we'll be able to import. So uh, the world will change even if Australia decides not to. And another great example is um, LED lights. You've probably heard of LEDs. Um, well, in uh, 2010, 1% of uh, the commercial and um, you know, residential lighting uh, was using LED lights. Well, now 2020, the estimates in 2020 are that we're gonna be around roughly 70% of um, the world's lighting uh, is already using LED technology and by 2025, the estimates are 95%. And a good reason for that is it's also economical. So this is a wonderful fact about uh, electric, uh, sort of the, the changes that are happening in electricity and things like that is it's not only does it make environmental sense, it makes economic sense. So from a can we change perspective, uh, the economic arguments also stack up. And so, someone far more articulate than myself is uh, Sir David Attenborough. And I love this because I think most families can understand waste. We've had the war on waste on TV. We've, uh, you'll understand things like, you know, plastic free July, um, these kind of things. Well, if you think about a lot of the causes of global warming is, is excess. So, I love to soak that in because it's, it's not just that waste is not just rubbish, it's also just wasting all of the things that we take for granted. So I'll leave you on that inspiring note and uh, let Charlotte answer, will the world use these solutions? Wow, what a hard act to follow. Not just you, Marty, but also David Attenborough. <laughs> so um, I'd firstly like to just congratulate everyone who tuned in today because um, Climate change is a hard topic to tackle. Um, and we were talking about this and part of the reason we don't have those conversations is we don't feel like we're, we have enough information. But 
I'd like to leave you on a more positive note that we absolutely will change and we already are, as Marty and Annabelle has demonstrated. So, and I'd also like to acknowledge that it's World Mental Health Day. So climate anxiety is a thing and just know that there's hope and there's help out there as well. So if we can go to uh, a big, a big signifier of, of that, that we can change is in December 2015, the Paris climate negotiations. So that's where the, every nation in the world came together and said, yep, we are actually going to take action on this. We see corporations do it. And as Marty talked about the private sector, um, I want to also touch on the, yeah, and look, our polls come up, uh, kind of sort of not really is, 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 is the one that um, is the most how we talk to our kids about climate change, kind of, sort of, not really. So hopefully we can change that and shift that to, let's make it part of the daily conversations we have or the weekly conversations we have with our kids. So this was a huge, this was a huge signifier and a signal to the market that this is something real and that we're all working towards. Yes, countries are pulling out, but they can't officially pull out until the day after an election. So this is why it's really important. The, the American elections coming up and also our local ones. So, I wanted to talk about what's happening locally to give you more hope. If you could go to the next slide, Marty. So you might not be aware that 70% of the, our emissions come from our cities. So we may be disappointed in what's happening federally or even state level, but know that it's usually your local council who are quite passionate about this and are doing a lot of action. So Sydney City and Melbourne City Councils, they're already certified net zero for their operations but they plan to take that net zero target out across their communities before the 2050 deadline. And the same with Newcastle City Council, where I'm from. And that may also surprise you because Newcastle is also the largest coal exporting port in the world. But they are trying as a council to, to do their bit for our emissions. And my local council, um, I've got a little shot there of Bondi, Waverley Council declared a climate emergency and a biodiversity emergency in 2019 and has committed to net zero, zero emissions. And I know councillors who are actively working on ways for strata and apartment buildings to access solar because around 80% of the population in Waverley live in apartments. I live in an apartment and it is a nightmare trying to, trying to get everybody to agree, the body corporate to agree for solar. So council's working on ways to alleviate that. So definitely find out who your local councillors are or find out what your local government is doing in this area. And it actually might give you a bit of hope and um, inspiration that there's work to be done. And what you can do on a local level can influence state and federal. If they can see it works and they have proof of concept, they will roll that out. So there's hope, just be proud. And even uh, Marguerite, who's on the call, I know that uh, she's working in local government and, and working on on these policies actively. And so the reason why most of the local councils get involved is they're involved with their community, they're part of the community. And Waverley didn't declare the climate emergency until shortly after the global strikes for climate. And looking at this picture gives me a little bit of anxiety because I think about how it's not quite COVID safe, but then this was a hugely momentous moment for, for everybody globally. And it was so inspiring to see the next generation hold up these placards and, and their leader of the movement, an 11, oh, she's probably a bit older than it now, Greta. Um, like we think about how do we talk to our kids about climate change, but a lot of the time we really should be listening to them. And I've worked in sustainability a long time and we would have to dress up sustainability as trust or social license or you know yes you might have a hit on on your income but this is what you should do for the planet and it was only those very passionate leaders that would you know implement sustainability solutions but now it it makes good business sense i have a friend who works for a carbon offsetting business um, and they have globally doubled their revenue in the last six months and there's not a lot of businesses apart from probably zoom that have been able to do that during this COVID year so will we change? My kids, my son, and I've just noticed uh, he does own more than that jumper actually, but maybe that's a nice climate change message to rewear the same clothes. He was actually born during that gigantic storm in Sydney, the, the one that washed swimming pools into the sea that uh, I live in Bondi and the Bondi to Bronte Walk was washed away. 
he was born during that storm. That was meant to be a one in you know 100 year storms, but it's now like a one in five year storm because of our change in climate. So they're actually in generation alpha, which I didn't realize there was, they had a name yet, but kids born from 2016 to about 2025 are generation alpha. Marty and Annabelle's kids are generation Z. So that's 1996 to about 2015. And amongst a lot of their characteristic and traits, you know, they're entrepreneurial, they're more into technology, um, they're competitive. They're, the trait that stands out to me the most and gives me so much hope about the future is change is welcomed by Generation Z. This is the generation that is speaking truth to power and that wants change, is willing to change and they're mad about it, they're doing it. So I think that's, that's really inspiring and we cannot wait for them to change the world, but we can do it for them. So I thought that was, there'll also be Generation Z and Alpha, the most educated generations in history. So we, we do need to talk about climate change to them. And I think about why I love nature and I want to protect it. And I, it comes down to my childhood. I was immersed in nature constantly. I was if I wasn't at the beach, um, and sorry, I have wet hair because I just came back from the beach. <laughs> if I wasn't at the beach, I was playing in the nature reserve that backed onto my backyard. Um, you know, we would see echidnas in our backyard, possums, every kind of bird you can imagine. And, and I think about, you know, we talk to our kids all the time about why it's important to pick up rubbish whenever we see it because a little bit of litter goes a long, long way and it's easy because we can see it and it's tangible. But climate change is a little bit harder to visualise and kids only really understand what they can see. So I, I always sort of think maybe they don't get it and maybe I shouldn't talk to them about climate change because they just can't comprehend it. They don't get it. And if you can go to the next slide, Marty, they get it. I asked my son, my four-year-old son, to draw a picture of a koala and this is, um, this is what he drew. And I, and, I, I, and I stand back and I let him choose colours, I let him do, do his thing and... It started off as a beautiful little grey koala and I was quite impressed because I thought, well, structurally, that's quite a good koala. And then he started painting it red and then he started doing the smoke everywhere. So if you don't think your kids are already learning about this, they are. They learn, they pick up so much by osmosis through you, through what you talk about, what you see, what they hear. Um, my kid, he was also building a cubby house yesterday and put up a wall and said, yes, we'll put up this wall because it's COVID safe. <laughs> so they pick up a lot. Um, and I think about my climate story. I grew up counting the wild koalas I'd see in my grandparents' backyard in Raymond Terrace. We, it, was, it was a common occurrence to see a wild koala in someone's backyard. And the most recent bushfires wiped out 71% of the population of koalas in New South Wales. So I don't want to just leave you on that devastating note. Let's, let's talk about the positives. My son's favourite animals are turtles, koalas and unicorns. Um, unicorns do exist. We, we've got that one. He, he knows it. Um, so this is how I can relate to them. So Annabelle talked about what Greenfleet is doing for turtles. Um, also, I didn't realize this, but Pacific green sea turtles, sex is determined by temperature of the sand. So if it's below 27 degrees, the eggs turn out to be a boy. And if it's above 30 degrees, the eggs turn to be a girl. So climate change is causing 99% of these turtles to be born female. So I try to relate it to my children's favorite animals. So when we hang out the washing, when we walk instead of driving, and we do a lot of that. When we share a bath, when we use cold water, when we catch a bus, when we turn off the lights, when we're having meat-free Mondays and why mum wears the same clothes continuously, we do this for the turtles. We do it for the koalas. So I try and talk about that in the positive. Like we do these things for them, for the animals you love. This is how we protect them. So some recommendations, I guess, you know, um, David Annabelle sometimes can be hard hitting, but you know, these are some books that are just really subtle about taking that message about climate action, positive climate action. I love Greta and the Giants, my one and a half year old, it's basically her favorite book, The Very Hungry Bear, The Lorex, um, if they're able to, to have the attention span for it, because my, my children are quite young, but 
gave an Attenborough or fight for planet A, it can be really positive experience for the whole family. They, they are immersed in this. And the great thing about being uh, having positive climate action is you don't actually have to change what you're doing. You don't have to talk to new people. You could just use your sphere of influence here. And we've got some top tips as well that we've all kind of come along the way. Um, and I'll open back up to, to my fellow parents navigating this space. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. I think in, in my household, it's, it's just about keeping the dialogue open. If we can educate ourselves and, and each other in our own sphere of influence enough to, to try our best to make good choices, then that's where we're going to start. You know, obviously my children are not old enough to vote, but I am. So, you know, I'm committed to voting for their future. My tip is to keep learning. Um, you know, the, I think that there sometimes there's this deception that uh, this understanding that parents know everything and we have to put that front on. But I think uh, just it's disarming to let your children know that, you know, oh, well, I don't know, let's find out. And there's never been an easier time to quickly find out that information. But then also embrace the experience, go down the rabbit hole. You never know what you're going to uncover. I was telling the guys, I learned so much about La Nina and El Nino the other day, just in researching this. And there's so many wonderful stories that go with it as well. So it's not just, uh, you know, learning a couple of scientific facts, but you learn historical information and there's always wonderful stories wound up in all of these experiences. And I think for me, hope is such a strong, a stronger and more powerful motivator than fear. So I kind of, I want to instill them with hope for the future and, um, and bring it back to the turtles, to the animals they love. You can't, you know, when we see climate change presented to us, it's with bushfires, it's with drought, it's with giant weather events. So I want to keep it on the positive of, we're doing it for the turtles, for the koalas and hell for the unicorns, because that will be a really powerful motivator for my son, I know. So if anyone would like, to pop questions in the chat or if you feel confident sing out um put it out there we've got a comment already i agree that our children um do get it it's how we help them put all the pieces together going out with david attenborough and i think that's the other thing too is it's a really easy thing to do is just to draw on your childhood as charlotte said so, yeah get them out in nature get them to love it Or watch it. Okay. Well, while we wait for the audience to fire up, um, I'll also just put a call out for um, if anybody uh, wants to educate themselves as an adult, not necessarily something that you might want to share with your kids, but Here's a couple of examples. Uh, if you're a reader, Where the Weather by Jonathan Safran Foer is amazing. Uh, if you love podcasts like I do, I was just listening to this this morning, Outrage and Optimism, recommended by a friend from school, was wonderful. Uh, every Friday, Christiana Figueres and uh, Tom Ravik Karnak uh, from the Paris Climate Agreement talk, All Things Climate, there's her interviewing Greta. And of course, we couldn't do it without Al Gore's leadership there's a second film, An Inconvenient Sequel, which was actually in the build-up to Paris. It does have an alternate ending where they uh, had to go back and talk about the changes in US politics at the time, but it is still a very inspiring piece. And uh, if anyone would like to pop a question in the chat, please do. I'm going to quickly present something. Um, I've got two fans here uh, who have something. <laughs> who are shying away so I'll bring it over this is for Charlotte um, my daughter has made this for your son so. oh that is so beautiful he will absolutely love that that's gorgeous so, oh thank you okay cheers that is very beautiful and I would get them but I think uh, it's nap time for my daughter and um <laughs> time <for> my son. <laughs> um, one of the questions a friend asked me this morning was um but she just doesn't feel like she knows enough like like what how do i even start that conversation 
So. Jump in, Annabelle. Sure. I think it's, um, it is really, that it can be really confronting, but I think what we've explored during this talk even is that there are so many ways in and actually, and I have to remind myself sometimes to just have the conversation because even though it seems hard to have it, in the long run, maybe it's harder not to have it. Um, you know, and I note from Nadine's comment that, um, you know, she and her daughter have really enjoyed watching David Attenborough together. Um, the last time I put David Attenborough on with my kids, it was this really um, confronting episode where all of the flamingos died because they were trapped in the mud because of climate change and couldn't fly. So my immediate response was to turn the TV off because it was too much to watch it. But I think after a while we came back to it and thought, you know what, and you know, obviously my kids are a little bit older and, and able to manage this, um, you know, we had the conversation about why this is happening and, and, and why we are doing some of the things that we're doing as a family, why we eat different types of meat now, why we, um, you know, offset our car, things like this to, to, um, to bring it back to what some of the impacts are. I mean, I remember um, being in a playground when my daughter was really, really young and she, they, they, they pick out bits of plastic in the sea of playground stuff they know it's not meant to be there. So I'll just echo Charlotte's point that they already recognize the difference between sort of the natural world and the world that, you know, that humans are sort of modifying. So I don't think there's any fear to be had in terms of not knowing. I mean, uh, I think there's, uh, like I said, uh, my point was just that you've just got to embrace the learning experience get your fingernails dirty, find out what the truth is. And, um, and there's never been a better time to learn about all of that. Well, uh, we have a second poll. So just to those who, and I'm uh, learning, here we go. You learn, you learn by doing. So it's like you said, Marty, you don't have all the answers all straight away. And it's funny, like I, I kind of, am afraid sometimes to, to have a conversation because I don't feel like I know enough and we were already did the training. You know, I feel like I have the resources at my fingertips, but I guess we, we're not expert as, experts ourselves. We're parents trying to navigate this. Sorry, that was my daughter crying. <laughs> Resisting well, that time. Look, there's no harm in us ending a little early. I'm just gonna launch our second poll if everyone would like to. Um, we're hoping that uh, that you'll be inspired feeling on those comments to talk to your children, to your families. Um, if you're not, be honest, <laughs> let us know. Um, I guess uh, now would just be a time um, for us all to, uh, you know, if you want to find out more information, you can connect with us. Um, I'm sure most of you all found out via a channel where you've seen our contact details. Do you guys have any other uh, recommendations for getting in contact? Yeah, I'm very, I mean, I'm very easy to find on, on LinkedIn. So please, you know, connect. I'd, I'd love to be in touch to talk about, to talk about this a little bit more. Cool. We can uh, all navigate it together. I've just put my email in there as well. So if that's easy, but mm -hmm. I guess it's LinkedIn. You can find anyone anywhere these days. <laughs> And I did mention at the beginning, this is, uh, this is Al Gore's um, 24 hours of reality weekend. It's actually a really big time for climate change at the moment. Ted are also doing talks on this um, and it's coming up to the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, sorry, the Glasgow COP. Is it, am I right? Is it Glasgow coming up? Um, which obviously in these times is going to be more of a Zoom than a <laughs> global event. But um, so, yeah, there's... Um, lots of other 24 hour uh, climate reality talks this weekend that people can tune into. We will be sharing this. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much to Annabelle and Charlotte for joining me on this. And thanks to Marguerite and uh, Abby for encouraging us um, and to everyone else at table eight during the climate reality training. And of course, I just want to personally thank all the parents who let us do these kind of things. So my wife kindly um, kept the kids company while they watch and um, were there when we were doing our climate reality training, which was happening at seven o'clock at night, which on weekends. Every, every parent online will know how 
Thank you so much. Um, I just, I think it, it's so important to use our sphere of influence. And as parents, we have the most valuable sphere right in front of us. So even if I can just hopefully influence my children to be climate action aware and and be positive and um i hope that the next drawing my my son draws isn't a koala on fire but but hope for the future so i will get there and I, I i really believe that um the future is positive and i love that drawing so much more thank you marnie it's kids <laughs> Yeah, and look, I just want to thank all the parents and teachers who tuned in today because, you know, sort of becoming more aware and more alert, alert is, is a perfect step.